Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Shirk. I'm the chair of the 21st Century China Center at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, UC San Diego. And uh, I really appreciate your joining us today to hear from Saring Topgill, who is an assistant professor of international relations uh, at the University of Birmingham and one of the leading experts on China-Tibet policy uh, in the world. I'm very proud to say that Professor Topgill is a graduate um, with a master's degree from the School of Global Policy and Strategy in the days when it was known as IRPS, International Relations and Pacific Studies. So. Uh, he studied with Barry Naughton and myself and other faculty here at GPS. And uh, we're certainly, he was a very good student and I'm not at all surprised that he's gone on to become uh, a leading academic working on China's uh, international relations and policy toward Tibet. Uh, now, of course, the, uh, he's going to be speaking on China's nationality policy with particular attention to the case of Tibet. But uh, right now, the leadership in Beijing is really struggling with uh, the Xinjiang issue in particular, um, which has joined the Tibet issue in becoming uh, a real uh, obstacle toward better relations with other countries. There are a lot of sanctions uh, being applied on the, by other countries uh, on the uh, repression in Xinjiang, forced labor in Xinjiang. But um, many of the practices that are being employed by the party leadership in Xinjiang were actually developed in Tibet. And the current party secretary was formerly the party secretary in Tibet. So the problem is broader than just Xinjiang. The problem is how does China manage its uh, non-Han ethnic groups, which of course are in very strategically important areas uh, in Western China. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Topgill and uh, he'll speak for a little under half an hour and then please post your questions in the use the Q&A function. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the 21st Century China Center website. Uh, this is the last uh, webinar of the academic year. Um, so we won't be having any formal ones over the summer, but please rejoin us in September. Thank you. Okay, Professor Topko. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Susan, for that uh, warm introduction and uh, also for uh, making this possible. Uh, uh, I would like to start by thanking you uh, so much for uh, talking to my department, uh, my colleagues and students at the University of uh, Birmingham. Uh, you know, they were both uh, highly impressed as well as uh, expressed that they learned a great deal uh, from you on that day. Uh, and I, I would you know, also like to say that it is uh, a special pleasure for me to speak to uh, people from uh, UCSD and uh, School of, uh, you know, uh, global, global Strategy. You know, we still fondly remember it as uh, IRPS. Uh, and, uh, you know, I learned a great deal about Chinese politics and US-China relations in your uh, classes and from Professor Barry Norton, you know, Chinese economics, uh, but also from uh, other great scholars on international relations, US politics, uh, from uh, IRPS, but also from other parts of UCSD. Uh, so I have very fond memories of uh, my time at UCSD. Uh, 
<clears throat> my only regret was that uh, I was too poor as a student to explore and enjoy uh, San Diego uh, more than you know I would uh, have liked. Uh, uh, but uh, so you know, uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and making this possible. So what I will do today is uh, start by you know uh, giving some context and you know the significance of the topic of nationalities uh, policy, uh, which uh, is in the title for this talk, uh, and also you know uh, uh, you know issues regarding Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, and other uh, groups in in China. Uh, I'll then go on to give a short uh, historical overview. Uh, you know, talking about what are, what are the theoretical foundations of Chinese policies towards uh, so-called ethnic groups or formerly national, nas nationalities, uh, the sort of main institutions uh, through which these, uh, you know, regions and uh, groups are sort of governed by the PRC today and uh, some of the actual policies. Uh, and then I will talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, the so-called second generation of ethnic policies debate, uh, we, 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 a debate that took place among Chinese uh, intellectuals, scholars, and you know officials uh, uh, with responsibility for minority affairs, uh, and then uh, talk about some of the actual policy changes in uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Inner Mongolia. Uh, uh, and then uh, you know, uh, I will spend some time talking about Tibet. I know. Uh, Xinjiang is in the news uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, which used to be Tibet uh, some, some years ago. Uh, but because we hear a great deal about Xinjiang and Tibet has sort of uh, been sidelined to some extent, I thought, uh, you know, I will uh, spend some time talking about Tibet. Uh, also because I am Tibetan, so I have some personal sort of uh, stake in it. Uh, so in terms of the context and significance of this topic, you know, uh, you know almost every day and every uh, week uh, in, in one newspaper or uh, you know, news channel, uh, we hear about issues to do with Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. Uh, and then uh, every now and then we also hear about Tibet and Inner Mongolia, uh, and you know, uh, sometimes also about other minority groups in China. Uh, just in the last couple of uh, days, uh, you know, the uh, Associated Press and Reuters news uh, groups uh, joined uh, a, a, an official group uh, uh, media tour organized by the Chinese government to Tibet and the Tibetan you know, capital Hassa, and they have uh, sort of uh, published their uh, observations. Uh, and then we hear a great deal about you know, these other groups and issues. Uh, so you know, how should we understand these issues? Uh, what is the policy context within China? What is the historical background? Uh, so, you know, uh, and then, you know, these issues are also discussed at the high, highest diplomatic sort of levels, uh, bilaterally and multilaterally. Just in the last few, you know, days and weeks, in the G7 communique, uh, Xinjiang was prominently mentioned in the in G7 statement. Uh, yesterday, I think, uh, in the EU-US joint statement, you know, after President Biden's visit to Brussels, Xinjiang and Tibet were mentioned in the joint statement and also in US politics, or for example, in the US Innovation and Competition Act, which is uh, a legislation, you know, that has passed through Senate, uh, Tibet and Xinjiang are important part of that, you know, bill. Uh, and then there are other sort of legislative activities such as the Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2020 uh, and uh, similar legislation on Xinjiang. So, uh, so what I will, what I hope to do is give some sort of uh, historical background as well as the policy and institutional framework to understand uh, some of these uh, issues. Uh, you know, when I say policy framework, uh, I'm talking about China's uh, policy and institutional uh, apparatus. <clears throat> Uh, and you know it's also important because these issues have concrete economic, diplomatic, and security uh, you know ramifications. Uh, just uh, because of the uh, sanctions by the United States and Europe uh, on issues to do with Hong Kong and also Xinjiang, uh, and you know China's counter sanctions, uh, the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement in on investment has been sidelined. So uh, very concrete economic and trade sort of impact. And also because of China's uh, anti-foreign sanctions law legislation, it will create a great deal of dilemma for 
multinational companies that are operating in China. Again, very strong economic and uh, business uh, impact. And then, you know, China-India border, you know, dispute and the clashes, uh, you know, last year, uh, there were uh, fatalities on both sides uh, and what it does for bilateral relations between these two big Asian powers, you know, uh, you know very important impact. Uh, and also, for, you know, in China, Western, or, you know, China, US relations, you know, these issues uh, always come up and create, uh, you know, uh, problems. And there's also the potential for, uh, you know, deterioration of China's relations with the Islamic world or the Turkic world, right? So there are various sort of uh, diplomatic, economic, and uh, security uh, impacts. So, <clears throat> which is why we need to, you know, uh, talk about these issues and understand these issues. Um, but, you know, most of you will not need this, but some of you might need some sort of background information on what we mean by the nationalities or ethnic groups. So in, in China uh, today, uh, there are 55 officially recognized uh, minority nationalities or ethnic groups, with the Han Chinese being the uh, majority uh, nationality. According to the 2020 uh, census, uh, the um, <clears throat> ethnic minorities, the 55, constitute 8.89% percent of China's uh, population, uh, with a total figure of 125.47 million, uh, as opposed to just under 1.3 million uh, Han Chinese, with 91.11% of the total population. And in terms of the growth rate uh, between the 2010 to 2020 uh, census, uh, the Han Chinese grew at a rate of 4.93%, and the ethnic minorities at a rate of 10.26%. Uh, and the ethnic minority share of the total population increased by, uh, uh, you know, 0.40%. Uh, and these groups uh, have been sort of put into uh, various jurisdictions, you know, five autonomous regions, 30 autonomous prefectures, 120 autonomous counties, and 1,256 1, ethnic townships. Uh, and, but most of these ethnic groups are very small in number, or culturally, you know, highly assimilated into China uh, to make a difference. Uh, but Tibet and Xinjiang are exceptions in both these instances, which is why most of the focus is on these two ethnic groups. Uh, so why is the nationality, you know, uh, uh, issue, these small sort of group of people uh, constituting just under 9% of the total national population, uh, a so-called nationalities problem or a nationalities question uh, from China's point of view. Uh, these groups uh, live in vast territories constituting over 60% of China's total uh, land mass. Uh, these, they live in border regions, uh, you know, des desiring greater autonomy or independence. Uh, they have transnational ethnic, linguistic or religious ties with people just across the border in neighboring states and beyond. And because of the geographical location, uh, these you know, entangle uh, China with other great powers in the region and other significant states. Uh, and from a political point of view, whether the, whether the Chinese government and the Communist Party is able to maintain hold onto them or sort of lose control over them has you know, strong implications for regime security. Right? And their economic interests, whether it's resources or trade routes, uh, or the cost of you know, ruling uh, these regions uh, you know, are also important economic considerations. And because you know, they live in uh, very difficult terrains uh, and you know, highly uh, you know, forested and mountainous regions, uh, and uh, there are also various types of human security uh, you know, challenges and interests. Uh, because of porous borders, there's a great deal of scope and activities to do with trafficking of various you know, items. And they also constitute what Andrew Nathan uh, called uh, the problem of stateness uh, to do with self-identity, uh, you know, uh, the ability to tell China's own story of, or narrative, uh, you know, to do with legitimacy and honor, you know, national image and all of these, uh, which is why you know, President Xi Jinping declared in Xinjiang in 2014 that from a long-term point of view, 
ethnic unity is the biggest issue or the biggest challenge uh, for China. So if, from a historical point of view, uh, you know, what do we mean by the nationalities policy in, in, in China? Uh, so uh, from a theoretical you know, point of view, uh, China had uh, its own traditional you know, model of integrating uh, sort of barbarian, so-called barbarians or non-Chinese uh, people in, in, this, uh, in, 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 in this region. Uh, but then you know, China, the PRC also had the Soviet model uh, of how to deal with uh, you know, different uh, ethnic groups or nationalities. And then uh, obviously there is a, you know, a lot of other international models, uh, the, the, the melting pot of the United States and uh, India's model, Brazil's model and many others. Uh, but you know, uh, the PRC was uh, influenced uh, to a great deal by the Soviet model, uh, but in the end, what it adopted uh, is uh, some kind of uh, uh, halfway measure between the traditional Chinese model of integrating uh, uh, non-Chinese groups and the Soviet model, uh, which you know I will, uh, which it essentially includes uh, recognizing uh, the, the uh, ethnic groups, uh, which took place in the 1950s, uh, and also uh, creating an institutional framework, uh, one of which is the you know national ident nationality identification or categorization uh, categorization uh, measures in the 1950s, uh, but also uh, constitutionally, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, so-called autonomy law uh, or the regional national uh, autonomy law uh, or system is a, an integral part of the Chinese constitution, which is section six and chapter three uh, of the Chinese constitution, uh, under which provision uh, there is a so-called regional uh, ethnic autonomy law which governs uh, you know, man, uh, affairs to do with these groups. Uh, so as I pointed out, the autonomous regions, uh, prefectures, counties, and townships, uh, they were created. And on top of that, various rights were enshrined, the religious uh, 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 belief, uh, freedom of expression, uh, the right to use uh, and learn in language, in native languages, <clears throat> and also the requirements to put the ethnic uh, identity or category of the person in the individual uh, identity cards or the xianfen zheng in, in Chinese. Uh, and in terms of policies, uh, you know, the, the autonomy law and the, the provisions are there uh, and also representation in, of ethnic minorities in the provincial as well as national uh, bodies uh, and preferential policies uh, to do with subsidize, subsidization of uh, the regional economies, uh, more lenient birth control measures, uh, and extra points for uh, university uh, entrance exams and, uh, uh, and other sort of uh, measures were also uh, uh, created uh, to manage affairs uh, of the ethnic minorities. So ju just to you know, comment on you know, this particular uh, framework, uh, obviously it is uh, different from the Soviet model, but highly influenced by the Soviet model. Uh, principally, the, the main difference is the Soviet model was more federal and the Chinese model is unitary as well as more integrationist and assimilationist. And uh, these policies were strategic, uh, not sort of altruistic uh, policies. As uh, Thomas Mulani wrote uh, recently in the Guardian newspaper, uh, these policies from the Chinese uh, communist in the point of view, uh, this uh, game plan was to recognize the ethnic identity into irrelevance, uh, to shepherd it into extinction, right? Uh, and also th this is a, an imperial and colonial arrangement with uh, features of settler colonialism in it as well. Uh, but after 2009, uh, you know, to move on to talk about the debates that took place in, among Chinese intellectuals and scholars uh, uh, in response to the Tibetan uprising in 2008 uh, and the self immolation that took place and the uh, clashes in uh, Urumqi and Xinjiang uh, and terrorist activities uh, in Beijing as well as in Kunming, uh, uh, Chinese scholars, particularly uh, Ma Rong, who is a scholar in Beijing University, uh, but also other scholars such as Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe, uh, both of uh, 
you know, uh, another university in uh, Beijing, uh, Tsinghua University, uh, they uh, talked a great deal about the need to reform uh, China's nationality policy. Uh, so both, you know, uh, both sets of, uh, uh, you know, reform proponents uh, talked about the, the danger and the you know, problem with China uh, copying the Soviet model. Uh, and from their point of view, uh, the uh, measures that, you know, give identity as well as special rights to these groups uh, instead of engendering a greater sort of loyalty and sense of Chinese-ness, uh, they, these measures uh, create greater sense of uh, ethnic consciousness uh, and, uh, and they, you know, their fear is that if China did, you know, did not reform its policies, uh, it will fragment, it you know, runs the risk of fragmenting just like the Soviet Union did. Obviously there are uh, differences between the two uh, sort of uh, 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 prescriptions and Marong was uh, very you know, sort of strong in expressing his difference and critique of Hu Angkang and Hu Lianhe. Uh, but essentially uh, the only difference is that Marong's uh, uh, policy prescriptions uh, were more sort of gradualist, uh, but you know, this, in terms of the substance and the outcome, uh, you know, both sets of measures uh, are the same that they would they you know the uh, expectation is that eventually ethnic groups will lose their identities they will adopt chinese identity and essentially become han chinese uh, which would uh, solve the so called nationalities problem or uh, nationalities question obviously there was a great deal of backlash from the uh, minzu establish establishment or ethnic minority uh, establishment uh, and also from minority groups uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then there were also sort of interventions by uh, Chinese officials, particularly Zhu Wei Chun, who was the uh, uh, director of the United Front the Department of the Communist Party. And then eventually in 2014, uh, Xi Jinping himself uh, commented or sort of took part in the debate. Uh, both, of, both of them uh, expressed the need to keep hold of the institutional framework uh, that I talked about, uh, but the need to uh, take up many of the economic, uh, political, uh, cultural, and social measures that were uh, put forward by Marong and Hu Angang, uh, which uh, essentially led to uh, the various changes that I will uh, talk about in, in, you know, in a while. So it, just to sum up, in terms of how much has changed, uh, the institutional apparatus of the you know, regional uh, ethnic autonomy law uh, and the autonomy law itself and the constitutional measures, they still in, exist. Uh, and also, uh, also the various rights enshrined there. Uh, uh, because you know, it, will, it is cost free to keep hold of these uh, 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 institutions, uh, but it is costly to remove them because uh, you know, these reform measures were put forward with the Tibetans and with the Xinjiang Uyghurs in mind, but removing the uh, entire framework and uh, uh, categories uh, would have impacts on how the Tuang people, how the Manchus and Hui, who, were, who are even more numerous in terms of the population. Uh, and, you know, it has the potential of uh, destabilizing these groups as well. It would also be inconvenient and difficult to change because the CCP and the, the uh, Chinese uh, state's identity has a lot to do with uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the narrative or the story that uh, they have been more sort of lenient and uh, better towards ethnic minorities than any other state or even uh, compared to the, the, the nationalist regime before it. And so there's a great deal of historical and institutional inertia uh, behind the need to keep hold of these uh, institutions. Uh, they also uh, need to take into account uh, what to do with this sprawling Minsu establishment, the, the, the officials and the institutions and departments uh, that run uh, minority affairs. Uh, but in terms of the policies, uh, there has been a great deal of 
uh, change, or almost radical change, particularly in Xinjiang, Tibet, and Inner Mongolia. Uh, so obviously, when we say change, uh, it's not you know change from a very sort of uh, benign uh, uh, you know policies to something very uh, you know repressive. Uh, obviously, there you know uh, both in Xinjiang and Tibet, uh, you know there has been a great deal of, deal of uh, repressive and assimilationist uh, policies and instruments applied, particularly the military, paramilitary, and other security instruments, and also economic instruments uh, uh, have been used uh, for decades, and these still continue uh, to play a role. Uh, but in terms of the level of uh, repression. Uh, and the level of securitization of everyday life in Xinjiang uh, and also in, in Tibet, uh, you know, it, it, it has increased, uh, particularly after Xi Jinping, uh, you know, took power. Uh, new police stations created uh, advanced surveillance technology using, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, construction of uh, internment camps in Xinjiang, uh, political education, you know, uh, charges of forced labor and the practice of putting, you know, Chinese officials as Han relatives in families in Xinjiang uh, to give political education, travel restrictions both internally and also internationally on Tibetans and Uyghurs. Uh, so these are some of the measures that uh, sort of point out the high level of repression uh, and uh, securitization of everyday life. And pref the preferential, preferential policies, uh, because China has now uh, removed the you know <clears throat> birth control, uh, you know two child per couple birth control uh, measure to allow every Chinese to have three uh, children, uh, th this effectively removes the birth control sort of affirmative actions uh, uh, for uh, you know minority groups, and then uh, in terms of the college education entrance. Uh, points, uh, they are also uh, being reduced and eventually uh, be, will be phased out. Uh, and also various types of uh, you know, assimilationist policies, uh, imposition of Mandarin uh, in you know, you know, primary uh, all the way to you know, university education, uh, creating boarding schools in towns where children, you know, very young children may be you know, put into boarding schools in Chinese speaking environments. Uh, so-called sinicization of religions, uh, destruction of religious and cultural sites and building other things on them, uh, incentivizing inter-ethnic marriages, uh, imposition of Chinese festivals uh, uh, and restrictions on local cultural and religious practices. Uh, you know, most of these have, uh, policy measures uh, sort of, uh, proposed by Hu Angang uh, and Hu Lianhe. Uh, you know, this, so this is uh, from a broader point of view, uh, looking at both Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, and Inner Mongolia. Uh, to go to, uh, to talk about Tibet, obviously uh, the, the objectives in, in you know, uh, Tibet are to stabilize Tibet, uh, to prevent another 2008 uh, from happening, and the, you know, the spate of several emulations uh, that went on from 2009 to 2018. Uh, and also to undercut the influence of the current Dalai Lama inside Tibet, uh, and also to uh, you know, strengthen China's position to play a role in uh, selecting the next Dalai Lama, uh, reducing the international space for the Dalai Lama and Tibetan exiles, uh, and essentially ending Tibet as an international issue or a cause. And from a long-term perspective, is you know, assimilating the Tibetans into, you know, uh, essentially Han Chinese, uh, and thereby constructing uh, an overarching Chinese national identity as opposed to uh, a Tibetan identity. So in terms of a, the policy, uh, let me see how much time I have. Uh, in terms of the uh, instruments and policies, economic development uh, has been used very effectively. Uh, it's very common uh, if we visit Tibet and uh, you know, talk to people in Tibet that the living standards have improved and the infrastructure development, all of these uh, uh, you know, have uh, been very effective. And the use of the various security measures and security forces uh, also goes on, uh, but also you know, various types of political repression and social control 
uh, you know, is uh, used in Tibet, uh, you know, uh, uh, to some extent, in some cases, to a lesser degree of severity uh, than in Xinjiang, but still uh, playing a huge uh, role in Tibet. Sinicization of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there are various elements to it, but I will skip it. And the imposition of, uh, you know, Mandarin Chinese in education, uh, in administration and in businesses and promotion of inter-ethnic marriages. Uh, and also this uh, it occasions the uh, hard line towards uh, the Dalai Lama uh, and also uh, essentially uh, not engaging in dialogue with the Dalai Lama. Uh, you know, if you go back into history, uh, you know, uh, until as recently as 2008, uh, there were a dialogue uh, and talks going on between the Dalai Lama's representatives and the Chinese government, but we uh, are not hearing anything about this. So uh, just to sum up, uh, you know, because of all these, uh, you know, developments in Xinjiang, in, in, in Tibet, and also uh, the, the international ramifications, uh, there are policy fallouts from uh, the debates that took place and also the uh, policy changes uh, that have uh, ramifications for the groups and the sort of the uh, specific regions, uh, but all, you know, also for, also for uh, Chinese uh, national policies, uh, but also a great deal of ramifications, as I talked about previously, on China's foreign uh, policy and uh, international relations. So I will end here and uh, hope I didn't take too much time because I didn't see the the. Uh, Reminder, of, you know, uh, after 20 minutes. Um, so I will end here and uh, take any questions if you have. Okay, well, thanks so much for this very um, comprehensive uh, analysis of the historical evolution of nationalities policy. Uh, I do think it's extremely interesting how the uh, fall of the Soviet Union uh, has uh, resonated in China, especially with Xi Jinping. I mean, actually, even going back to Jiang and Hu, Hu Jintao, but Xi Jinping seems particularly obsessed with the possibility of uh, the same thing happening in China that happened in the Soviet Union, which of course had not been predicted. It was uh, came as a big surprise and shock to the system. So I'm really interested in how the discussion about nationalities policy plays into this negative model of the fall of the Soviet Union. So do you think that um, Xi Jinping, is there evidence from his statements in recent years that he believes that the Soviet Union's fall was uh, at least in part caused by having the wrong nationalities policy? And do you see any linkage between the increase in repression in uh, Tibet, Xinjiang, and Inner Mongolia as being connected to that mindset? Yeah, I haven't um, seen Xi Jinping directly, you know, commenting on the Soviet uh, experience, but um, I, I, I'm very sure that he has been influenced by the uh, writing of Ma Rong and uh, Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe. Uh, uh, most sort of many China scholars may not know about uh, Ma Rong and uh, Hu Lianhe, but I'm sure most of you will know uh, Hu Angang, who is a very you know, influential policy analyst and advisor to the Chinese government uh, on various you know other issue areas, right? Uh, but uh, both Marong, Marong started the game very early in the 1990s, you know, and 2000s he was writing. Uh, but Hu Angang and Hu Liani joined the debate in 2011. All of them uh, and many other Chinese scholars 
uh, you know, commented on the uh, problem of China relying on the Soviet, uh, you know, model uh, and uh, the, the risks that China will run in terms of fragmenting, just like the Soviet Union did, because of the way, uh, you know, uh, the Soviet Union and in their perspective, China is still, uh, you know, running ethnic affairs in terms of uh, giving identity, uh, you know, categorizing, in, uh, in Marong's terms, politicizing, you know, uh, ethnicities. Uh, and his proposal is that uh, unlike the Soviet Union, China should go back to its traditional sort of practices and also to the you know, use the U.S. experience of you know assimilating you know various national groups and also India's and Beijing's into you know the the melting pot sort of uh, model uh, and uh, essentially culturalizing rather than politicizing ethnicities. And in their uh, advice was that if China did not reform and move away from the Soviet model. China will also fragment, just like the Soviet Union did. And uh, Xi Jinping actually used the, you know, uh, in 2014, you know, when he joined the debate in from Xinjiang, he used the sort of metaphor of, uh, you know, the seeds in a pomegranate fruit, that all the ethnic groups are, you know, different seeds in a pomegranate. Uh, uh, so. And then he used that metaphor very, you know, often. Just a couple of days ago, he visited Tibetan regions in Qinghai province, and he again repeated that model, right? So I'm sure that, uh, you know, although I haven't personally come across Xi Jinping commenting on the Soviet experience, uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, he is very much uh, in tune with uh, the Soviet experience and the, the negative lessons that China should learn. Uh, which is true from, uh, you know, what the Chinese uh, leaders learned about, uh, you know, how to avoid uh, the uh, sort of breakup, of, you know, of the Soviet Union and uh, uh, how other sort of great power clashes ended up in war. So the, the, the Chinese leaders learn about, you know, uh, the Soviet Union and other great powers in history and uh, avoid the negative lessons. And so um, Barry Naughton asks, you know, is there a specific year which you could call the turning point in China's ethnic policies toward a more assimilationist and repressive approach? Yeah, but, so I mean, does it start with Xi Jinping or does it go further back and what year? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Norton. Uh, I'm very happy to learn that you are here. Uh, so uh, obviously, as I tried to mention, uh, China's policies, you know, dating back to the 50s and 60s towards minorities have been, you know, at times very harsh, you know, during the Cultural Revolution and democratic, democratic reforms. Uh, but also there were moments of sort of more relaxed and liberalized policies in the 1980s. Uh, uh, but uh, what we are talking about now is uh, uh, enhanced levels of assimilation and repression, political repression, right? Uh, which we see in other uh, uh, Chinese policies towards civil society groups, uh, mm -hmm. towards Christians, uh, uh, towards you know Chinese democracy activists, and all of that. Uh, but so these, are, I think, most scholars would point to uh, you know. The period around 2014, uh, and uh, you know many scholars would probably go to the you know time Xi Jinping took over, you know, in 2013. Right. Uh, so most of these uh, policies, uh, you know, particularly in Xinjiang, uh, took place between 2014 and uh, 2017, and they are you know going on. And as I said, these are to some extent you know response to the unrest in Tibet in 2008, unrest in Xinjiang in 2009, unrest in, uh, in Inner Mongolia in 2011, uh, you know, over land rights and all of that, and particularly to the uh, terrorist activities in, by the, you know, Uyghurs in Kunming in 2014, uh, and then also the, you know, uh, activity, you know, actions in uh, Beijing itself. And not to talk about the various clashes and 
uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, resistance activities in Xinjiang itself after 2014. Uh, so I would say 2014 or, you know, Xi Jinping's assumption of power in 2013 uh, would be when we started seeing, you know, enhanced levels of repression and, you know, assimilationist policies, which were actually nothing new. Uh, they have been going on for many years and decades, but what we are seeing, you know, in terms of these, you know, uh, concentration camps or internment camps, uh, you know, various, you know, uh, uh, strong repressive activities in Xinjiang. Uh, and also, you know, we also see some of that in Tibet as well. Uh, uh, you know, for, for example, the language rights in 2020, uh, you know, China, uh, you know, uh, the Inner Mongolian uh, Autonomous Region decided to take away uh, uh, language uh, sort of uh, education in Mongolian. Uh, which was used until now as the language of instruction or medium of instruction in schools in Inner Mongolia. Now the decision has been made to use Mandarin. In Tibet and in Xinjiang, uh, they have uh, uh, in various Tibetan regions, you know, this has happened in different time periods. Uh, but, you know, in Xinjiang, I think it happened to a greater degree after 2014. Okay, so it seems like the upheavals, the protests in Tibet and Xinjiang in 2008-2009 didn't lead to a change uh, right away. This is, of course, the Hu Jintao administration then. And so this more assimilationist and repressive approach, well, the strike hard start then, or does it uh, await Xi Jinping coming into power? Yeah, Tibet and Xinjiang has gone through various so-called so strike hard campaigns, uh -huh. you know, uh, spiritual uh, uh, campaigns, you know, anti-Dalai Lama campaigns in Tibet, uh, various types of, you know, campaigns or rectification campaigns, social control and management sort of campaigns, political education campaigns, it, it, this has been going on for many decades. Uh, yeah. So it but is the assimilationist um, objective um, is particularly strong once Xi Jinping comes in. Yeah. That's is that I mean. is I gather that's your analysis. Okay, that's that's quite interesting. Um, so um, we also, uh, another question is, these scholars who were promoting a more assimilationist approach, Ma Rong, Huang Gang, Hu Lian He, um, do you think they envisioned this level of repression that we have today in Xinjiang? Do you yeah, think I, they, I, I, some, I mean, it, is there any evidence that that's not what they intended and it was simply taken uh, further by Xi Jinping and those who were trying to, um, to follow what they thought was Xi Jinping's approach? Yeah. Actually, Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe. Hu Lianhe actually is an anti-terrorism uh, expert. Uh, so they actually um, went beyond what Hu, you know, Xi Jinping has done. Uh, Xi Jinping has, you know, you know, changed many of the policies, but you know, he has kept the sort of this institutional framework and everything, uh, you know, you know, still now. Uh, you know, Hu Hu Lian Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe actually uh, proposed uh, various, you know, most of the things that we are talking about in terms of, uh, you know, cultural assimilation, um, uh, you know, they have been proposed by Hu, Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe. Uh, Hu Lianhe, they, they proposed various sort of political measures, uh, various types of economic measures, various types of uh, social measures, 
and cultural measures all meant to uh, remove the you know these institutions, political institutions, the legal frameworks, and the rights, uh, uh, and uh, uh, all the affirmative action policies. They wanted to remove all of that. Uh, oh. Essentially, essentially, uh, they proposed the U.S. melting pot uh, model, where everyone should be treated as you know equally as citizens, but these group rights, you know, uh, you know, and the group categories. Uh, and the institutions, the autonomy institutions, uh, the autonomy law, all of them should be scrapped. So, and, and on top of that, there should be you know, Mandarin Chinese education, there should be you know, uh, inter-ethnically mixed schools instead of separate schools for you know, different groups, you know, uh, inter, you know, uh, incentivizing inter-ethnic marriages. Uh, all of these were you know, measures proposed by Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe. And, on top of all these cultural, economic, and they were also talking about, you know, uh, redistricting, uh, removing all these ethnic sort of uh, jurisdictions, uh, and making it easier for everyone to move around for economic reasons, but also for uh, the so-called three inters that you know he uh, they proposed the, the inter interchange, intermingling, uh, and. Uh, uh, so there, there was also the so-called three inters, you know, essentially calling for a fusion of et, you know uh, ethnic groups, so that you know one overarching Chinese ethnic you know group you know will be uh, formed uh, instead so, of all these you know ethnic categories and identities. So uh, Pomo Tenson asks about uh, whether or not these folks drew inspiration explicitly from the American model of the multicultural nation with one identity. So you, they talk about that quite explicitly. And of yeah. course, it's kind of interesting that they're proposing a melting pot approach at a time when ethnic and racial conflict in America is pretty intense. Yes, yeah. So uh, Hu Angang and Hu Liani explicitly used the U.S. model. They also looked in the uh, uh, proposed the Indian model, uh, the Brazil model, uh, and Marong actually, uh, you know, studied and lived in the United States for many years. He actually did his PhD from Brown University. He's a sociologist, and uh, I, I met him in a conference at Harvard University in 2007. And uh, so he again explicitly, uh, you know, proposed the U.S. model. Uh, obviously, in the backlash and the debates uh, in which uh, you know, Tibetan, Manchu, uh, Hui, and uh, Mongol expert scholars uh, sort of uh, refuted or in debated his, you know, uh, theories or proposals, uh, and also in the scholarship outside China by people like. Uh, James Leibold, uh, Michael Elliott of Harvard University, and uh, 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 Atwood uh, on Inner Mongolia. Uh, so they also, you know, critiqued, uh, you know, their use of the United States or India or Brazil as models uh, because, you know, they, you know, they, they fundamentally, you know, did not understand, you know, how America, you know, came to adopt this model and and, and the, the, the context in China and America historically and also today are very different and, and also you know they were not sensitive to all these racial uh, problems in United States but also you know uh, inter tribal and inter sort of uh, uh, linguistic clashes in India uh, so yeah th th this was one of the major critiques uh, of Marong and uh, who uh, Angang and Julian He. So um, uh, Paul Evans, our colleague in Canada, he asked about whether or not the concerns about terrorism differentiate Beijing's policies toward Xinjiang from Tibet and Inner Mongolia. So do you think that 
the worries about terrorism make the Xinjiang policies even more repressive than in these other places. Yeah, so I should preface uh, my answer by saying that China has been quite liberal in using, you know, terrorism, the terrorist label. Uh, you know, they, they use this label, you know, to talk about uh, Tibetan self-immolators. -im uh, they use this label to the Tibetan Youth Congress, which is, you know, a harmless NGO, you know, group in uh, India, uh, doing only sort of uh, uh, mostly, you know, social service work. Uh, but you know, it is, you know, uh, I think a uh, valid line of sort of argument. Be you know, first of all, you know, even now policies in Tibet and Xinjiang are different. But you know, historically, even among Tibetan regions, or, or when we talk about Tibet, uh, we are not just talking about the Tibet Autonomous Region because for the Tibetans, Tibet is the most of Qinghai province. You know, if we leave out Xining, which is now mostly Chinese or Hui. Uh, and then, you know, Western part of uh, Sichuan province, uh, you know, parts of uh, Yunnan province and also Gansu province. So these constitute the traditional homelands of the, the Tibetan people. So, mm -hmm. you know, even among these, you know, different Tibetan regions, there have been uh, different policies, uh, you know, applied. Uh, so, uh, you know, to some extent, the policies in, in Tibet and Xinjiang uh, is different today in terms of the harshness uh, because of uh, the fact that, you know, the, the Uyghurs, uh, you know, a very tiny minority of them uh, engaged in uh, terrorist activities. And also, you know, some of them joined these transnational Islamist groups like, you know, uh, the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and fought in different places. Uh, so, you know, uh, China has uh, some legitimate grounds on that, uh, on that, on that score. Uh, Okay, great. So um, another uh, person, Isabel Henrion, she asks if we believe that the Chinese leadership is in agreement on this second generation ethnic policy or Xi Jinping's more assimilationist uh, and repressive approach or do you see any sign of dissenting views or even um, dissenting views on the less assimilationist side or even on the more extreme assimilationist side in the yeah, leadership they, they, among the politicians? Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it is very hard to uh, figure out, you know, yeah if there are sort of politicians or, you know, leaders at the national level or at the provincial levels, uh, you know, who dissent. To some extent, it's very difficult to, to dissent against Xi Jinping, you know, under For the sure. political context. And, uh, but, you know, when the debate was taking place uh, before, I think Xi Jinping sort of came on one side, uh, there was a lot of uh, pushback, uh, you know, from within the, the so-called Minzu establishment, the you know uh, official dom, uh, you know in the United Front uh, and the the Ethnic Affairs Commission and various places, uh, and also in the uh, the Minzu universities, uh, where you know uh, there was a lot of critique of Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe and Ma Rong uh, for these policies. So I'm I'm sure there are uh, and and some of these scholars who were you know important sort of. Uh, players in the think tanks. Uh, uh, one uh, Mongol scholar uh, was all, you know, was I think the vice director of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, and also very influential sort of Manchu and Hui scholars uh, also uh, critiqued who uh, Marong and the, the others. And I'm sure within the official dome, there are people who dissent, uh, but you know, it is not <laughs> advisable to dis descend against Xi Jinping at the moment. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to see that the international flack is so intense now. You know, whether or not this uh, leads to any higher level elite discussion about a change 
in approach because uh, Beijing is certainly paying a price uh, in its international relations. Yeah. Any uh, thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if we uh, go back to uh, uh, you know a few a couple of weeks ago, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, seemed to be advising his you know, wolf warriors to tone down uh, their you know rhetoric and you know create a more sort of benign image of India, in, in China, a more positive image of China. So it, you know, he seemed to have learned to some extent uh, from the sort of uh, international backlash and the deterioration of relations with very important. You know, trading partners uh, and uh, diplomatic uh, partners, and also you know, facing uh, criticism from you know multilateral you know institutions. Uh, you know, just in the uh, last couple of days, I came across uh, a United Nations you know set of scholars who, who you know who uh, wrote a report. Uh, you know, talking about their concerns about you know reports of organ harvesting in. You know Xinjiang, you know in Tibet, and you know Falun Gong, and you know they need to investigate this. Uh, so uh, it, it is possible that you know uh, uh, because of the international uh, criticism, uh, you know lessons will be learned to some extent. Uh, but but I don't think uh, you know Xi Jinping or or, or China uh, will be able to. Uh, Change, you know, too much, uh, yeah, because of the, you know, the policy sort of context in China, uh, but also uh, the need to stand firm uh, in, 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 you know, in front of the in, in international criticism. Uh, so yeah, um, well, I think it this is uh, this is so interesting. We we've, we've reached the end of our hour. Um, but I hope that uh, you'll join us again in the future to keep us well informed and update us about the policy debates inside China about these very important issues as, as uh, the leadership in Beijing struggles to figure out how to keep control over its periphery, not just Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, but Hong Kong. Yeah, and, I'm sure, and of course they think of Taiwan in this way as well, yeah. um, uh, as well as manage their international relations with other countries, very, very challenging. And as you point out that what they're, what's happening in Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, it's also the increase in surveillance and repressiveness is not limited to the ethnic minorities, but yes, also extends to other parts of society. Well, thanks so much for visiting with us and thanks to everyone for joining our discussion and for the excellent questions. So we look forward to seeing you again, maybe even in person next sure, time. Definitely. I, I would love that. Thank okay. you so much, Susan, and thank you, everyone. Okay. And, uh, take care. Stay safe. Okay. Have a good summer, everybody. Stay, stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye.